Now we are on to our last conversation for the day, and this is all about the Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substance Amendment Bill. Now, this is something that has elicited such reactions, and especially from the larger part of the community, and more so looking at the legal minds, just trying to understand the consequences of this amendment bill before it is assented by the president. We want to help you understand what these changes will mean for those who are affected in one way or the other with the use of narcotic drugs. With me in studio to help with this conversation, I have two guests with me. I'll start with the lady. She is the other lady with me on set. To my extreme left, she is Joanne Wanjiro, who is an advocate of the High Court. Good morning, Joanne. Thank Good you for morning. being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Karibu sana. And we also have Dixon Malebe, who is a community paralegal. Karibu sana, Dixon. Thank you. Thank you for making time to be with us today. We want to learn better. We say knowledge is power, and we are here to fill that gap. So let me start with you, Joanne. You know, let's just take a step back. Mm -hmm. Put the amendment bill aside. For the benefit of our viewers, and in terms as simple as could possibly be, mm -hmm. what does the Narcotic Drug and Psychotropic Substance um, Act say? Okay, thank you so much for that question. I'll try and make it as um, relatable as Absolutely. possible. That is what we are here for. Yes. So in Kenya, yes. the law that regulates issues to do with drugs mm -hmm. in terms of drug control, um, control of supply of drugs, yes. control of demand of drugs, is the Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances mm -hmm. Control Act. It's an act of 1994, mm -hmm. and um, within that act you'll see issues of planting of drugs, you'll see issues of trafficking of drugs, issues of possession of drugs. So ideally it is the national law that governs drug-related activities mm -hmm. in Kenya. All right. Now let me come to you, you know, uh, Dixon. When you look at the levels of awareness among the people when it comes to such an act, do you feel as a population we are well aware what the law says about narcotic drugs and especially those found in possession of uh, minimal amounts? Well, um, thank you for that. Unfortunately, not so because yeah. um, there's been a lot of issues of like stigma surrounding um, issues of, of, of drugs, mm -hmm. possession, um, trafficking. There's a big distinction between between uh, the various uh, players in the in the in the whole um, space. Yeah. But um, now, because of that, people don't seem to understand the, the, the repercussions or the effects of, of this bill if it were to go through mm -hmm. on the community as per se, because it actually will affect everybody, not just the drug partakers. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Now, same question comes to you, Joanne. When you look at literacy levels about what is enshrined within the Constitution, and especially when it comes to narcotics and drugs, because we do know um, drug abuse is a burden in our country, mm -hmm. and especially among the youth who are sadly heavily affected, mm -hmm. awareness levels among the people, how are we faring? Where would you gauge the population? I would say we are not doing well yeah. in terms of awareness of what the law says and the implications of the same. Mm. Even in enforcement of these laws, we are not doing well because you'll see if you talk to an officer whose work is to enforce the law and they find someone with um, maybe just a small in possession yeah. that is for their personal use, mm -hmm. they will have a hard time in terms of what are we supposed to charge this person with? Mm. What is the procedure that's supposed to be followed when you, from the point of arrest to the point of prosecution until the end? How are we supposed to handle evidence? And even for the general public and for the users themselves, a lot of people don't know exactly what the law says about drug use. Yes. Someone will, um, there was a case I think recently, some years back, of a woman who was found with very, like, three, four, five rolls of bang. And she was arrested for the same. And when she was arrested, she told the officers, he si yangu, nina pelekea, jail. So and so, yeah. So you see, in the law, that is defined as trafficking. Because you're and found in possession yes, of... not even that, because trafficking is you're moving it from point A to point B. So by you saying, it is not mine, I was taking to Nani, then the law calls you a trafficker. A trafficker. And the punishment for trafficking in the current law is you pay a fine of about a million shillings. And on top of that, you get imprisonment for life 
and all you did was say it's not mine it's nani's and the prosecution is well within its right because the law says if you're moving from point a to point b with a substance that is trafficking okay so there's very minimal awareness on what the law says and the implications of the thing now looking at the law as is before we get to now the amendment bill from where you stand do you think even the um, penalties that have been enshrined therein generally speaking are fair looking at the different um, anybody who has a role to play looking at the traffickers those who are found in possession and even the users do you feel like the consequences that are there and penalties are a bit too harsh or relatively um, something that is deserving of the sin, quote-unquote, using the word sin? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, good question. Well, in my view, definitely not, because um, when you talk of like possession for the minimum quantities for somebody who is using, and the law gives the same punishment in the, in the sense that it's incarceration, is having them imprisoned. And um, from past experiences we've seen that doesn't work mm -hmm. actually what works is more of maybe rehabilitative interventions uh, medical interventions because like um, problematic uh, drug users these are people who are consuming uh, the minimal quantities you're talking about yes these are people who are probably struggling with issues of wanting to actually stop the the, the, the habit yes so when you incarcerate that person they they go in for six months, for a year, but when they come out, they find themselves still in, they're trapped in the same vicious cycle. So it's uh, the law as it is does not like cater for different players because a trafficker is considered the same as a peddler who is considered the same as a problematic uh, drug user. Yes. And um, the punishment is the same across the board. So when you look at it, it actually not, it's actually not fair because uh, you can, get, you can be, be jailed for a long period of time for just a minimal quantity, mm -hmm. which medically you're supposed to use it for your body to function like any other. Yeah. So the intervention would be better if it was more on the side of rehabilitation, mm -hmm. at least in the sense of uh, medical interventions, the, the medical programs that are run by the government as it is, that uh, actually assist one better. Okay. Yes. Now, let me come to you, Joanne. Looking at the proponents of this particular amendment bill, Mr. Koinange, one of the arguments that he presented was that this um, act of 1994 has various weaknesses, and I'm quoting, mm -hmm. um, that the Narcotics and Psychotrophics Act of 1994 has various weaknesses that have necessitated the amendments. The penalties do not match the devastating effects the substances have on the health of the community. Do you think this is a valid argument? Well, and answer that um, in this way. There is immense and enormous global evidence mm -hmm. that punitive approaches are not working. Yes. Punishment is not working. Punishing the user does not automatically reduce demand for drug use. And I'll give um, a practical example of a country like Portugal. Portugal um, decriminalized drug use in their country. Mm -hmm. So what they do for users is if you're arrested with a quantity that is for personal use, you're redirected from the criminal justice system towards a commission that has a doctor that has a lawyer, that has a social worker. Mm. So they sit with you and they find out, is your drug use problematic? And if it is, these are the treatment programs that are available. These are the rehabilitative programs that are available, and you're given an option to choose from those that are tabled for you after they decide um, from their consensus that yours is a problematic drug use. And since they began doing that, um, you will read in terms of facts, drug use has gone down immensely in Portugal. Incarceration has gone down. HIV levels have gone down. So there is global evidence that punishment is not working. And if you read the original, the genesis of the amendment bill, mm -hmm. when um, the MP Fonyali brought it up in 2019, was to increase the punishment for the traffickers. And as um, I'm part of an initiative called the caucus on harm reduction and drug policy reform mm -hmm. and as part of what the caucus is saying is we don't 
disagree that there is a need yes. to deal with the supply aspect of drugs. And if you want to deal with the traffickers, that is fine. But you also have to be alive to the fact that this very law is very disproportionately affecting the, the user. user. How often have we seen people have been arrested with two rolls of bang? Very recently, I saw citizen reported an NIS officer mm. arrested with 120 shillings worth of banging. Is that really how we want to use our public resources? When there are health interventions that have been put in place where someone can be diverted. So what we're saying is now that the amendment is going on, use this opportunity to do what works, to do what has been proven to work, which is stop treating drug use as a criminal issue mm -hmm. and treat it as a public health issue. Okay. Now that you're amending the act, don't say if you're arrested for possession for personal use, you will be incarcerated for five years. No, divert that person to treatment programs that are already available. You cannot avail services and then the laws are impeding people from accessing the services that are Okay. Available. Now, I like what you have brought up, you know, the aspect of categorizing um, to each their own, depending mm -hmm. on what category they have been uh, found to be in. Mm -hmm. And that is actually one of the things that has been said to be the good, because we're here to fairly look at this particular amendment. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is something that has been said to be one of the good that is in this amendment bill, such mm -hmm. that they have categorized mm -hmm. um, different um, people when it comes to this uh, amendment bill. Mm -hmm. There are the drug barons, the wholesalers, and the users, because previously it wasn't so. It was one blanket covering all. Mm -hmm. Do you feel this will actually be, or rather is the first step towards um, a more progressive way of addressing narcotic drug use here in our country. Let me start with you, Dixon. Um, <coughs> yes, I agree that there's um, the categories you speak about, but um, in the sense of the, the punishment mm -hmm. that the different categories are receiving, uh. is still not like the categories, it's still a blanket mm -hmm. in that the drug user, the problematic drug user, yes. um, is still, it's still not by law that he's supposed to get medical intervention or rehabilitative, mm -hmm. it, the law still says that he should be incarcerated and to pay the hefty fine, yes. which is Ooh, probably exorbitant com considering the amount that he's been arrested with in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it becomes, um, because when you look at it, it's actually supposed to be a corrective measure. The, the prisons are supposed to be corrective facilities. So if you're trying to right the wrong, then the law should also, like, categorize the different um, punishments to the different groups in my view yes okay and let me just come to you jo uh, Joanne you know looking at these consequences you know both financially and in terms of incarceration mm -hmm. if we're honestly speaking do you feel a combination of all these uh, penalties that are involved, you know, it could be financial, mm -hmm. it could be incarceration, and also treatment if it is involved in this particular um, value chain, put together is the way forward that is required to have a more effective and sustainable way of doing things as opposed to just having fines or in pr uh, doing prison time and then you're let go, go figure out your life after that. Okay. So what uh, we're saying ideally is, how the law is going to be, um, how, how the proposed amendments have been framed, mm -hmm. especially in terms of now the user in possession for personal use. We recognize and we applaud um, the MPs for actually even putting grammage to say if you're found with one gram or less, mm. then you will be charged for possession for personal use and you will be imprisoned for a term of not less than five years. Yes. However, they have now taken up the fine to you be asked mil. to pay five million. Yeah. So if I'm buying um, something worth 120 shillings, there's no way I'm going to pay a fine of five million. So that almost automatically still guarantees mass incarceration. Yeah. And what we're saying is the efforts and the resources that are being put in place to arrest, to prosecute users, those are resources that can actually be diverted to the health sector mm -hmm. to strengthen the treatment programs to strengthen the rehabilitative programs so that there's an alternative to incarceration for users. You decongest your prisons, 
your manpower is better used to capture those traffickers that you're targeting. So the proposals that are being made, we recognize the efforts that have been made and we commend them and we applaud them because they have actually started a timely discussion on the need to reform laws. Yes. But we are also saying the reforms we are proposing are beneficial across board. Okay. They're not just beneficial for the user because if you look at public resources that are being used in prisons, in arrests, in the judicial process, mm. all those can be diverted to the health sector, not just for the user, but for the general public as well. You know, I like the fact that you brought up the whole question about the prison system, especially as it is, our prisons are already overcrowded. And you find for most of those people who go to prison is because they do not have the purchasing power to pay some of these fines. Mm -hmm. And consequently, they resort to doing time. Mm -hmm. And Looking at those who are the larger category of those who are found to be having problematic use, mm -hmm. they do not have the financial capacity to pay for these fines. Mm -hmm. Now, legally speaking, mm -hmm. do you feel there ought to be a whole shift when it comes to even how some of these offenses are categorized to avoid such? Because for one, there is the financial implication mm -hmm. that is tied to all these uh, crimes that are committed. Mm -hmm. It is a crime nonetheless. Mm -hmm. There is a financial uh, burden that is tied to it. Mm -hmm. But if it is categorized under a whole different category, maybe let's for the purposes of this conversation, call it a petty crime yeah. that does not require one to go through the entire prosecution up until incarceration mm -hmm. and it be handled at a level that does not end up to prison. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that is something that is practical to start with? Yes, I do. I think it's practical and possible, dare I say, possible. Mm -hmm. Because now that the law is actually being amended, this is the time to put in those provisions. This is the time to actually distinguish. Because as the law is now, mm -hmm. there is no distinction between a person in possession for personal use and a trafficker. Yeah. They are cheated almost the same. Not almost, they are actually cheated the same. Mm -hmm. So if you put in an actual definition to say a person to be charged with possession for personal use must meet one, two, three, four criteria. A person to be charged with trafficking must meet one, two, three, four criteria. Then you have it in the law also to say if you are found to be in possession for personal use, you are diverted. You mm -hmm. make it mandatory for the judicial officer yeah. to divert this person from the criminal justice system into the already available treatment programs or into voluntary rehabilitation. Then it will deal with all these issues of incarceration. Mm -hmm. It will deal with the issues of overcrowding. It will deal with the issues of access. Because Kenya has done um, a fairly good job in terms of availing these interventions, the harm reduction interventions. We have methadone programs. We have needle and syringe exchange programs. We have HIV testing and counseling. Yes. So the treatment programs are there. But the way the law is now, it is impeding access to the same by the users. Because if I am arrested with a portion that's for my own personal use, I will not be treated as a problematic drug user. I'll be treated as a criminal. Okay. So I'll go through the criminal process, which then leads to incarceration, as opposed to immediately you have identified me to be a person with problematic drug use. You divert me away from mm. that system and towards the treatment program. Okay. I'd say it's the same thing as HIV testing and counseling. Testing is not mandatory, but it's advisable. When you go to a hospital, the reason you're given pre counseling is so that you understand why it is that you need to get tested. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing as a user. A lot of people will say, um, what if we divert them and they don't want? There are a lot of mechanisms involved in harm reduction. It's not just the treatment. There's counseling. You get to explain to someone why is it that you need one, two, three, four, the things. importance. What yeah. Yes, and then from that understanding, they themselves get to choose which they prefer and that personal responsibility also gives them the motivation to go through the entire program and finish. All right. Now, let me come to you, Dixon. Looking at this amendment, do you feel there was enough public participation done to make sure that the public understands what these changes that are being proposed would mean and consequently be applied without question because they agreed to it? Well, unfortunately not, because the public participation that took place actually um, absent were key stakeholders. Mm -hmm. For instance, organizations that have been the forefront of um, dealing with issues related to, 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 to drug use 
Um, I'm talking about people like NASCOP, the NACADA, National AIDS Council, civil societies, key stakeholders who are actually not part of the public participation. Mm -hmm. So that's why you're seeing, I think, the discrepancy coming in because a lot of input that will have come from even the actual community itself um, will not, will have not been brought forward to this law. Mm. So you see a lot of things that are actually missing from it in that sense. And earlier on you spoke about the um, petty offenses. It reminds me something that according to the um, criminal justice um, conference, seven out of ten um, inmates are actually petty offenders. Imagine that. Yeah. So, and um, these, are, these are people who are serving misdemeanors. So these are crimes that are serving sentences of less than six Negligible. months. Negligible. Yeah, so, so even when she's speaking of resources, what is being put in the prisons, even to maintain the big number, and a, a lot of that number will actually be not there if alternative means of um, correctivation. Corrective measures. Yeah, corrective. <laughs> Quote, unquote. Yes. So or in if, place. If, yeah, if they're in place. So I think that's a big discrepancy in the whole law because um, you find a lot of people getting into the prisons. Another thing um, she's also mentioned is that these interventions, are st uh, they're already there, they're in place from the government. The government has also put in resources, mm -hmm. like for instance, the, the part of the harm reduction is the medically assisted therapy, mm. whereby the government oh, is yes. offering methadone, which is really expensive. Uh, as in an average Kenyan cannot like pay for methadone treatment but this has been offered free by the government um, in two centers in Nairobi now at the coast mm. and the two in Kisumu likewise and it's all for free there's counseling services professional counseling services you know to hire a professional counselor for now you're gonna pay not less than a thousand but this these services are already there it's not like it's something that the government needs to start all over again. Mm. So now if this law comes into place, then even this facility is not really going to be of much value yeah. then because you'll be arresting the user and instead of the user going to the facilities that have already costed this amount of money to set up, end up they in prison. They to be empty shells. So yes, yeah, so it becomes like recycling a wheel like we're just going round and round and round and not coming up with a concrete solution of how to end the menace. So as much as we appreciate that the there the, the, the needs some intervention, mm -hmm. the drug menace is also great, it's, it's large, it's increasing, so we need some corrective measures and ways of truly stopping this menace. Okay. But uh, at the same time, we need to consider the fact that the problematic drug user is not like the cause of the problem. Mm. The problem actually is the epicenter is somewhere else. Okay. So with the barons yes. as have been <laughs> captured in this particular bill. Now, as we close this conversation, I'm told we are completely out of time. Let me come to you, Joanne. You know, very briefly, when it comes to um, a proactive approach to this amendment that you feel um, there are loopholes, gaps that need to be um, filled in this particular bill because clearly it wasn't as informed by all the stakeholders, th those that are in the value chain. Mm -hmm. What would be your message to even the president before he gets to ascend this particular bill? Okay. Very so briefly. Okay. What uh, I think, what I would say on behalf of the caucus would be, um, don't sign the bill. Just bring it back, table it with all the key stakeholders so that we can bring in the key issues that the caucus is talking about and mm -hmm. advocating for. Properly and properly by properly, I mean actually distinguish between possession for personal use yes. and possession with intent to distribute and trafficking. Mm -hmm. Once that is done, make it mandatory that if you're found in possession for personal use, divert this person from the criminal justice system into the already available treatment programs or into voluntary rehabilitation. Okay. It will cost you, it will cost very little 
and it will actually save on a lot of public resources. For the Absolutely. Time. Now, this is a conversation that we can't once again fully exhaust in this one sitting, but of course, until there has been change that has been made, either by the president um, assenting it or not, that is when we, until then, we will be having these conversations to just help you better understand what amendments to this bill really mean to us as a population. But for now, we have been speaking with Joanne Wanjiro, who is an advocate of the High Court, as well as Dixon Maleba, who is a community paralegal. Thank you very much, lady and gent, for being with us this morning. Thank you for having us. And with that, we want to call it a week. Thank you so much for being with us from Monday up until now. We want to wish you a lovely weekend. Do enjoy the rest of your viewing, and be sure to join us again next week for another fantastic week of Good Morning Kenya. My name is Jen Wamboy. Have a lovely day. God bless. Yes.